We at Oak Lawn UMC. 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 We at Oak Lawn UMC believe that everyone deserves to be loved, heard, affirmed, and respected. We at Oak Lawn UMC believe that as a church, it is possible to offer this to one another when we listen, learn, appreciate diversity, and, and love God above all else, and our, our neighbors, neighbors as ourselves. Therefore, as individual parts of the church, we pledge to move towards this corporate reality so that the church can be a voice for the voiceless, a home for the wanderer, a respite for the weary, a balm for the hurting, God's presence in the world. Good morning. Good morning. Ha Howdy, Oak Lawn. Happy Sunday. We've got some more folks coming in. We've got a line at the back door. So I'm going to keep going. I'm going to stretch it a little bit while everybody comes in and finds their seat in a bulletin. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, my name is Pastor Ryan. Welcome to those of you that are here in the sanctuary and uh, those of you that are worshiping with us online. I love that the rails are back because I can walk in front of the altar and the podium and not feel like I'm going to fall off. <laughs> so if you see, notice that I'm moving around a lot more, it's because I have my protective, what do they call these in, um, in bowling? Bumpers. I have bumpers here. Bumper rails. Thank you. All right, if you are rather new to Oak Lawn, again, we're glad you're here. I hope you got a welcome brochure uh, from one of the greeters. Um, I thought Chuck was going to model it for us. Uh, but we've got uh, these welcome brochures, which let you know all of the amazing things that are happening at Oak Lawn. On the back is a connect card that you can remove. Um, this is what uh, helps us get to know you better. So fill out the connect card. Um, you, will get, you will have coffee with a pastor. Um, place this in the offering bin or in the offering plate or give it to a, a pastor. Again, we're excited that you're here. If you're online, there's a link in the comments to do all that. We've got a lot going on at Oak Lawn. Um, it's that season of homecoming and all the things that are, are happening. And so I'm just going to highlight what's going on this coming week. Um, all of our events are at olumc.org slash events. Um, we've got a couple of slides to go with this today at 1.30 is the Vision for Change um, Day of Love and Choice. So this is a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood out on the lawn. Um, if you get a concert as well, that's right. That's right. Big old concert. If you have, um, if you'd like, if you have, have any questions, certainly visit us, come out at 1.30 or um, see Denise after service. And then at five o'clock is our blessing of the animals. So bring your fur babies uh, for pet treats, a blessing, and humans will have treats too. We're promising that. Um, so we can't wait to meet all your fur babies at five o'clock today on the lawn. I don't have a slide for this because it's up and coming or we just decided we we're gonna do it. On Tuesday, uh, the Chosen Family is going to the movies together. So we are gonna go see Bros at um, Alamo Draft House in the Cedars. Um, I have a QR code that's out on the Hospitality Center um, counter, so you have to go this way after service. How does Pastor Rachel do that? We go this way after service to go click that connect or that uh, QR code to get the ticket um, link to buy your tickets. But it's at 7.35 on Tuesday with your chosen family at Alamo Draft House in the Cedars. Very excited about that. And then Wednesday is Happy Hour with Pastors. So this is another opportunity for you to come and spend time with the pastors. And we're doing it a little different uh, this time, starting this time. So you can feel free to join us on Zoom at five o'clock, or you can come to church. Um, we're opening the parlor uh, for those of you that would like to be here in person for Happy Hour. Um, grab a drink at Union, maybe there will be some Cokes in the parlor, um, but come 5 o'clock on Wednesday and chat, catch up, we'll be together for an hour. Uh, lots of opportunity for connection here at Oaklawn in the coming week, uh, but right now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. 
Good morning, will you rise and join me in the call to worship? The words will be on the screen and they're on the back of your bulletin as well. How will we be a voice for the voiceless, a clarion of courage, a clarion of peace, for the silenced, the ignored, the unheard? How will we be a home for the wandering, a place to belong, a place to know peace for all who remain on the margins. How will we be a respite for the weary, quiet for the soul, refuge of peace for those exhausted by the struggle? How will we be a balm for the hurting, a healing presence, a transformative peace for the bitter, for the angry, for the wounded? God, in our giving, give peace, for we are God's presence in the world. Let me invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, number 399. We'll sing all verses, and the words will be on the screen. find you a seat anywhere. Where do you want to sit? That's yours right there. She spoke to me this morning. I'm winning. <laughs> okay, well maybe not. I was winning earlier. <laughs> good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Yeah? You good? You know, we're going to talk. <laughs> she said, I spoke. That's all I need to do. I'm done. It's all right. I love you. See you later. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> so, you know what I want to talk to you about today? I want to ask you 
You know how we give money to the church? Why do you think we give to the church? <laughs> We're not talking about because your parents, so I know. But <laughs> why do you think we give to the church? Anybody? Why do you think we give to the church? Yes? We give, we give money because we need to um, give faith. That's very good. Give money because you give thanks. Anybody else? We should give money so that the homeless people can get homes. So we, the homeless people can get homes. Anybody else? So sometimes we think that when we give, we have to give a whole bunch of money for it to make a difference. What, what do you think God thinks is better? If I had a whole bunch of watching. What's <laughs> back there? If God has a whole, if I had a whole bunch of money, or if I only had a little bit of money, what do you think God thinks is better? If I only have a little bit of money, or if I have a lot of money, what does God want more? Do you know? What do you think? Uh, what? You think God wants? Well, you know, a lot of money is good because it helps the church to do the work, right? We have to pay the bills. We have to make sure the programs that feed the hungry and all of those things are taken care of. But do you know what? It's not about how much we give. It's about where the gift comes from, from our hearts. Because sometimes the scripture says that when Jesus was in the temple, all of the people with lots of money came and they gave and they put, made a big show of it. But the, the poor widow who didn't have any money, just two mites came and gave all she had. Sometimes she didn't have enough food. And Jesus said, she has truly given from her heart because she gave from not from her excess, not from what's left over. I want to tell you a story. When I was a little girl a long, 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 long time ago when candy was a penny, my grandmother would give me 50 cents, two quarters. And she said, put this in church. And then I'll give you a nickel after church to go get candy. Mind you, penny candy, that was five pieces of candy. And I, so I said, you know, if I only put a quarter in, I can keep a quarter, and then she's gonna give me a nickel, and I got candy for the week. Yeah, I was thinking already. And one Sunday, my grandmother asked me, because I didn't think she ever caught me, and she said, how much candy did you buy? And I, I told her, she said, that money was for church. And she said, who do you think loses out when you don't give what you're supposed to? And I had to think about it, and what she told me was, God can do so much with the little that I have, but I have to give it freely from my heart. And she reminded me that I'm always taken care of, that I'm always loved, even when I don't have any money. And you, so do you know why we should give like that? What that does, it's not giving money to God because God needs the money, but don't stop your giving, you still need the money. I'm just throwing this as a lesson for the children. So. <laughs> What we do is, what, when we give, because everything belongs to who anyway? What does, who, what is everything, who does everything belong to? It belongs to God, it belongs to Jesus. Every, so we're giving back to God what already belongs to God. God doesn't need our money, but God needs to know that we trust Him. Right? Do you trust God? Yes. So you can give from your heart. You can give because you know, you wanna show God that you love God and that you trust God. And so we don't give from what's left over after I bought a video game or candy. We give first to God who gave first to us, right? Right? Yes, yes. All right, well, come on, you wanna, would you close us in prayer? Don't act surprised, I asked you before service. <laughs> don't act. No, no ask a prayer. Let's stand up. Let us stand. Y'all act like y'all worked all week. Oh. Come on, let's stand. Come on, stand up. Dear Lord, we thank you for the offering 
that today we thank you that we give from our hearts, knowing that God can do more with the very little than all that we have combined. We just thank you for the spirit of giving. We thank you, Lord, that you give us the will to trust you and we to show you that we trust you and we love you because you have continued to bless us in so many ways. We give you all of these, we'll give you all the praise and the glory. Amen. In the spirit of giving from our hearts, I want to invite you all to rise as you are able and share with one another signs of peace and love as you greet one another this morning. Good morning. My parents taught our family about tithing and pledging to the church and about giving 10% of their income um, and it was biblically based and so we grew up hearing about that and watching them do that and when I was 13 and had my first job babysitting, and I was a huge Beatles fan, um, I was so excited to be able to buy that new album called Abbey Road. <laughs> And so I was going on and on to my mother about, oh, I'm going to buy that album. And she said, well, now, how much is the album and how much did you make? And when I told her, she said, well, you're going to need to babysit again to be able to afford it because you're going to give 10% of what you made to the church. Oh, but that didn't go over real well with me. <laughs> Not, a, you know, to have to wait for Abbey Road. So anyway, um, she then said something that I heard her say most of my life, and that is that when you earn money or get money or have money, it's God's. It's all God's money. And he's so generous to let us keep 90% of it. And so um, I, I will admit that it took me a while before I, I truly grasped that it's not my money. And uh, so let's take a look at uh, some of the slides that show where we are in our budget. So you can see that our budget is funded um, by offerings and tithes only 77%. And so that means we have a budget shortfall of over $300,000. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that we can do this. We are an amazing congregation that pulls together. And so we've reduced our budget by this amount by almost 80,000 and um, we had an income increase that wasn't expected. And so if we give, I think the next one shows, um, yeah, 14% of our congregation pledges. And so we'd like to increase that to 100%. Why not 100%? We can do that. And um, 
And as a result, if you just look at, at the monthly contributions, it looks like we're not going to make um, our, our pledges this year. But if everyone could find 36, just on average, some more, some less, but on average, this amount of money, we can do that. And uh, when you enter the church today, you got a budget worksheet just to help you think about where you might allocate your, or God's money. <laughs> um, and after church, uh, we'll be in the hospitality center in case you wanna whip out your phone and find the exact spot on the website where you can make a pledge for 2023. And if you cannot stay for church, then um, I'll just go ahead and tell you now, you need to go to olumc.org slash give love. It's really important to put that love on the end of it. Give love, and that'll take you to the 2023 pledge. And the theme of this week's part of the stewardship program is give love through peace. And I have a cousin who says that there are two kinds of tired. Um, there's one kind of tired that can only be cured by sleep, and there's another kind of tired that can only be cured by peace. And I think she's absolutely right. Haven't you ever just gotten so exhausted in search of peace that you know that peace will be the only thing that really uh, satisfies? Well, our church offers peace. Maybe it's peace to those who are hungry and cold and need our food or shelter. Sometimes it's peace that we fight for through an act of sacred resistance or peace that we advocate for through marching for a cause, protesting injustice uh, or inhumanity. And anytime peace is being sought, it's because there's a conflict. And one of the many things I love about this church is that our pastors and our processes really emphasize the importance of going deeper than just words to solve a conflict. And I know this might shock you, but we don't agree on everything but we delve deeper into our meanings and our intentions and our vision uh, that we have that might differ from one to another. And that's how we seek peace. And we share meaning, intentions, and, and words, not just words. And Thomas has agreed to help me demonstrate this. Uh, will you welcome him, please? <laughs> Thank you, sir. So we are going to demonstrate an analogy, and it's about conflict in our search for peace. And so let's say, remember it's an analogy, our palms are our words. And so when Thomas and I are communicating, we're communicating our words to each other. And we show the world our words, our palms, uh, when we share our opinion. So Thomas, what do you think we should do about supporting the women in Iran who are being beaten, jailed, and even killed for not wearing their head covering correctly? What do you think we should do? Uh, I think we should contribute money to an organization uh, that uh, is defending these women. Hmm. I think we should cut our hair in solidarity with them. Money. It's about the hair. No, money. Hair. Money. Hair, because all we're doing is repeating our words. But we need to change our perspective. And if we were to look at the backs of our hands, where our meaning, our intentions, our goals and wishes are, um, we need to move side by side and say, okay, now what did you mean by that? Uh, now we're looking at. Okay, now we're looking at things. Uh, from different perspectives, deeper level of understanding. Yeah, and we become better listeners and can get to um, we can get to peace that way. And it's one of the many reasons that I give to this church because of our emphasis on peace. High five. Thank you.
for the reading of the Gospel this morning. Our Gospel lesson today is from Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Listen for the Word of God. Looking up, Jesus saw rich people throwing their gifts into the collection box for the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow throw in two small copper coins worth a penny. He said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than them all. All of them are giving out of their spare change, but she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It is a great joy this morning to welcome Scott Larson, who's our chair of our board of trustees and member of the choir, and uh, and so on and so on. I could the list can go on, but we are so grateful to um, hear what you have to share with us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Rachel. Morning, church. Morning. Could you all pray with me? Holy and loving God. What do I have to bring before the testimony of this widow? What words can I say that match her example? God, I pray that you focus our hearts on this nameless person that appears in our scriptures from 2,000 years ago. This person who speaks out through the centuries to us today. Maker, savior, sustainer, I ask that you guide my words. And that those words, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Amen. So, for those of you who don't know me, Rachel gave me a great introduction. My name is Scott Larson. I am the chair of our board of trustees here at the church. I've been a member here for about a year and a half. But Oak Lawn has been part of my life for this last decade that I've spent in Dallas. Um, and I'm going to get into why I'm the one talking to you today. Um, I'm not a pastor here. I'm not a pastor anywhere. Um, and I'll explain why I'm in front of you today. But before I do, I want to begin by stating my purpose plainly and clearly for you. Um, for those of you who are maybe new here, uh, who have been going here for a few weeks, this may be not so much for you, but if you feel it, that's great. This is more for those of you who have come to find this place as your church home, that have come to find this group of people your chosen family. My purpose is for you, and it's a request that you've heard already today and probably last week. I'm asking that you give a portion of your money on a regular basis, that you commit to giving a portion of your money on a regular basis to this church. It's an uncomfortable request, but it's not one I'm ashamed of making because of what this church does and what this church is. Before I get into these, uh, this witness that we have today from the Gospel of Luke, I do want to talk about why I'm the one standing in front of you today. There's a logic to the chair of the Board of Trustees being in front of you asking for money because it's part of my responsibility and the responsibility of our other board members to make sure that this place stays up and running. Um, the trustees make sure that the lights stay on, we make sure that when the roof leaks, we get it fixed, or are trying to get it fixed, and figure out what we're going to do with the building back there. Um, I don't know. Has anyone been up to the f third floor recently? No one? No one? There's, there's a reason for that. It's gutted right now. So <laughs> we're here to figure out what to do with this building in a way that serves in God's ministry. So I'm here in that capacity, but I'm also here as a member of your chosen family. This place has become a home for me. This place has become a shelter and a shield for me. This place is a voice for me. I want more people to have that. I want more people in our community to know that. So I'm here also as a member of your family. And there's a third capacity, a third way in which I'm before you today, and this is a little strange. I'm before you today representing my 22-year-old self. 
See, about 10 years ago, last February, was the first time I ever came to Dallas. I was born and raised in Iowa on a farm, um, little, little tiny high school, went the county over to Iowa State University, and did my undergrad there. Now, through that entire time as I was growing up, I had pretty much one idea of what I was going to be when I graduated college and went on to my professional career, and it wasn't a lawyer, which is what I am now. See, there was, a, from a young age, I would, um, I had a habit of setting up pulpits in my house and making my family members listen to sermons. We had snowstorms, a lot of them in Iowa, and any time that we had one on the weekend and church got canceled, my family knew that they had to line up in the dining room when I, where I had our chairs set up like pews because we were going to do church. Um, I don't remember many of my sermons from back then, but <laughs> it was always my aim, I think, to be a pastor. Now, life changed that a bit for me. Um, I grew up in a, a Lutheran church, and then as an act of teenage rebellion, I went way conservative and started going to an evangelical non-denominational church. And I then tasted about every denomination there is before finally landing on this place, the Methodist Church, as my church home. In that process, as I was going from these churches, finding answers, one of the things that I knew I was looking for but couldn't admit to anyone around me was that I was different. That I didn't like the people that I was supposed to like. In a little town in Iowa, I realized that I like boys and not girls. And I think when you realize that, at least for me at that age, you decide whether you're, whether you're going to fight it or not. And when I was in eighth grade, I made the decision that I was going to fight it. And of course, when you do that, you go and find people who will fight it with you. And because of that decision, I tasted the worst that the church can give. I took on judgment in myself. I gave it to others. And my life with God became one consuming question. How do we get this fixed? How do we change this thing about me that's not right? All the while, I was still progressing on my way to become a pastor, to go to seminary, and in undergrad, I started becoming a youth leader to a local church, a local Methodist church, where I was um, teaching the... Uh, Confirmands, the 7th and 8th grade junior high kids. I was teaching high school Sunday school and leading their youth group. And it was great. I loved it. it um, and as I went into my final year of undergrad, one of our new confirmands came up to me after about, I think it was our second week. And he pulled me aside afterwards and started telling me about how he felt like he was different. How he felt like he didn't quite fit in, how he didn't like the right people. And as I stood there, looking at this young man, asking me, what does God think of me? I turned inward, obviously, immediately. See, at that point, I got to the conclusion that, well, it's not going to work with girls. It's not going to happen. So I'll just keep him single the rest of my life. And as I looked at this boy asking me for the affirmation of God's love, seeking after that, I knew I couldn't impose that upon him. I couldn't do that. And as I realized I couldn't do that for him, I realized I shouldn't be doing that for myself. And so I became okay with the fact that I am who I am. And I reconciled that with with my God, with our God, but then I looked at the church and the state it was in, and I said, nope, not going to do that. Because then, even more so than now, our greater denomination, the Methodist Church, didn't know what it was doing when it came to gay folks who were called to ministry. The local church I was serving in sure as heck didn't know what it was doing. Um, and so I didn't see a place for myself there. 
So I got out a piece of paper, did a pros and cons list, and realized, hey, boy, it might work out. So that's what I did. <laughs> and I also started looking for law schools where I wanted to go, places where I wanted to have a livelihood. And this is what I told the official, um, this is, was my official answer during interview processes in law school. You know, I looked at some uh, cities in the south because I don't like winter, and I found some great places where there was, you know, bustling economies and, you know, a great place to find a job. And Dallas was the one that I wanted to go with. That's what I told all my uh, law firms I interviewed with. In truth, well, that's still true. But what's also true is around that time, as I had become okay with who I was, I made a dating profile online. And I started talking to, of all people, a cadet and the Aggie Corps down at Texas A&M. As an Iowa State guy, that was, it was a little hard to take at first. <laughs> but as we talked, um, as we Skyped, that was before Zoom, remember, um, and got to know each other, I felt something that I did not know I would be able to feel. Wanting to be with someone who wanted to be with me which is sheer bliss, and so I said, okay, I'm going to Dallas, because that's where he wanted to end up, so that's what, that's what I did. And so I came down in February of 2012, a brand new city that I was planning to move to, confident in my faith, but having no idea where I would fit in in the church, and I went to SMU, visited the law school, and later that night, I met up with, his name was Mark, and it was absolutely wonderful. And he convinced me to do another thing that I didn't think I'd ever do, which was go to a gay cowboy bar <laughs> down the street at Roundup. And as we came out in his truck to go there, we parked down the road here. And as I walked up Cedar Springs, this was the first church, the first Methodist church I saw in Dallas. And I looked up and, you know, our very white Jesus <laughs> was in the Garden of Gethsemane looking mournful. But this church was here on the corner. And as the years would pass, rainbow flags would go up. And this church was here on the corner in this neighborhood. This church speaks. Its very presence speaks. It speaks peace and it speaks welcome. And it did for me and it's done, for, done so for so many of you. And as the chair of the board of trustees, this church needs our help, this building needs our help. <laughs> um, we walked through the slides up on the, the deck there. We, we need your help to keep this place here. So that's me. That's the introduction to me and why I'm standing here. Now I wanna turn to the text that we have today. And I, Cody, can you do me a favor? My water bottle's up there. I appreciate it. So I reached out to Rachel about a month or so ago and offered to speak during our stewardship campaign. And she asked me what scripture I wanted to come out of. I had two. One was from 1 Timothy about not muzzling the ox, which if you know what that means, it means pay your pastors. So that was one thing I wanted to come out of because we should be paying our pastors. But this was the other one that I looked at. And this is the one I decided to go with. At first, it seemed like an obvious text for a stewardship campaign. I should put that on the altar. Here we go. Here we have a poor woman, a pious poor woman who's giving everything she has. And how convicting would that be for everyone when it comes to a stewardship campaign? How convicting would that be for all of us to give more, to give something? That's the easy way to read it, but as is usually the case when I dig into scripture, I started looking at it more, and then one, I got confused. I got confused. Because I'm seeing this God of mine who has become flesh just posting up in the temple and watching this happen. This widow give away her entire livelihood. 
And he just comments on it. He says, look what she's doing. Isn't she great? And I start going, wait a minute. This isn't right. And so confusion led way to anger, which again, frequently happens for me when I dig into scripture. Because I'm sitting here looking at this passage and I'm going, here's a widow who has nothing, who has passed by the incarnate God on her way to give up her entire livelihood. And instead of saying, hey, disciple number two, three, and five, you're in charge. Make sure she has a place to stay. Make sure she has a home. Make sure she has a meal. Instead of saying that, Jesus just says, wow, look at her. Surely she has given more. If she didn't give out of her abundance, she gave her entire livelihood. So I'll admit, I got a little mad. And then I listened to the entire Gospel of Luke from start to finish. Johnny Cash, who does a really good one on Audible. Because I wanted to figure out what was going on here. Because this wasn't right. And then I realized that I was just not reading everything. So you know how we have chapters in the Bible, and then there's verses? That's not how the books were written originally. Those came in later. I think the chapters came in around the 10th century, and then the verses came in around the 16th century. It's nice. It makes, things referencing, it makes referencing things easier. But we put those in there, those divisions. Actually, some very old, old European men put those divisions in there. And so I'm going to take you back a few verses before what we just read. And you'll realize I shouldn't have been mad at Jesus. I was mad with Jesus. So this was what we just read, what Rachel just read, was chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. So it's the very beginning of the chapter. If we turn back the page and go to the end of chapter 20, we hear this. In the hearing of all the people, this is Jesus in the temple, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes. By the way, that's sometimes translated lawyers. So, <laughs> Who like to walk around in long robes. Modern day long robes. And love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. And have the best seats in the synagogues. And places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses. And for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Now, he looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. I want to know who decided to put the chapter break right there. That's what I want to know. Because it doesn't go right there. That is one commentary. You see, there's this, at the time, in the Jewish temple, in the Jewish way of life that Jesus grew up in, there's a type of offering that the religious elite would expect sometimes of folks, would require them to provide. And it was a huge amount of money that children would give to the temple, and in so doing, they would not have enough, have enough money left to take care of their parents to take care of their widowed mothers. There wouldn't be enough there. Where did it go? To the temple treasury. To outfit the chief priests and the scribes with nice fancy robes. And Jesus was calling those folks out because out of their abundant living, out of their fancy living, they were devouring widows' houses. And then, lo and behold, the moment he gets done saying that, walks in a poor widow with her two pennies and drops them in. This makes me think that Jesus and this widow might have had this staged beforehand. <laughs> like, talk about timing. But it also does make me think maybe this isn't the first time that Jesus saw this widow. So the Gospel of Luke, it it's, might be my favorite. John gives it a run for its money, but 
What I love about Luke is just the richness and detail of Jesus' life that we get. It's in Luke that we get that story when Jesus is young and his parents take him to the temple for Passover. It was Passover, right? That's what I thought. Like, don't think it was the uh, day of the tabernacle. But anyway, so he brings, his parents bring him to the temple when he's young. And it's a party, you know, Passover. It's a huge celebration for the Jewish people. And Jesus gets lost. Or that's what his parents think three days later when they realize he's not on the caravan back home with them. And can you imagine what that must have been like? Like, not only did you lose your, like, seven, ten-year-old son, but he also happens to be the incarnate son of God that's supposed to save all of humankind. It's like, whoops. <laughs> but they come back, and they search for him, and they search everywhere for him, and where did they find him? In the temple. Asking questions and giving answers of these religious elite these priests and scribes, lawyers, bandying words with them. And it makes me wonder, you know, about, this was about 23 years before where we are now, today, with this widow. I wonder if she was around then. I wonder if Jesus saw her then. The scripture doesn't necessarily tell us this, but it does tell us that up until that point, Jesus' family had gone to Passover every year. And so I would think that that would carry on throughout his life. And this might be something he does up until the beginning of his ministry is go to the temple for Passover. It's what most devout Jewish men would have done at the time. Maybe he saw this widow time, year after year, bringing all she had. So maybe he was waiting for this opportunity, waiting for this moment so that he could do something that she could not do at the time. So that he could speak on her behalf. Because as a woman, as a widow, as a member of an oppressed nation under an empirical regime, she had no voice. All she had was this one thing that she could do, which was to bring in all she had and put it into the temple treasury. That's all she had. And so I think maybe, maybe Jesus had this in mind for a while. You know, fitting our gospel today into the bigger picture, Jesus is probably three days away from dying. Jesus says, at this point, come in on the donkey, Palm Sunday's happened. This is Holy Week. And I wonder if this is something he wanted to make sure he got done. Is to point out this widow who gave everything she had. Because she deserved a voice. And now here we are 2,000 years later. She still deserves a voice. But it shouldn't be me. Speaking on behalf. On her behalf. She should get the microphone. She should be the one to stand up in front of us. And tell us what God means to her. That should have been the case 2,000 years ago. And it should be the case today. And this is why this scripture, I think, fits so well in what we're talking about in this stewardship campaign. That is precisely what this church does. You hear it every Sunday. A voice for the voiceless. Let the voiceless have a voice. Let them speak. Let them be in leadership. Let them preach. Let them be pastors, even though they're gay and in committed long-term relationships. Let us stand up to do that. That is why I give. That is why I commit my time and my resources to this place. Because it's what Oak Lawn does. This building speaks and advocates for those that don't have a voice list. Our pastors speak and advocate for those who don't have a voice. And not only that, but we also pass the mic. We also empower the oppressed and the marginalized, not just to have a home and a place and a sanctuary, we empower them 
to be advocates for themselves. We train them to lead us, to teach us, and in so doing, teach the world, and God bless it, the great United Methodist Church, what God can do. She just had two pennies. That's how we often remember her. But she is also an example for us. We should remember her for that. And she also has a story to tell. And though we may not be able to hear from this widow, at least on this side of glory, there are members in our community, members of marginalized groups, who have a story to tell. And you know what? To help them tell it, they deserve our support, our time, our resources, and yes, our money. So please, for the sake of the widow and for the sake of the marginalized, I ask you, I come back to my purpose. Think about how you might give a portion of what you have on a regular basis to this church. Commit to giving it, and that's really important. We need the commitment. We need you to get online and say this is what will happen because we need to be able to budget. We need, able, we need to be able to know what we're going to have. So commit to giving and please give. This is how we give a voice for the voiceless and stand up. Thank you. If you pray with me one more time. Holy and loving God. Some 150 years ago, some faithful Methodists came up on a lawn shaded by oak trees and decided to start a church. I'm not sure what they would think of us now, Lord, but I have an idea of what you think of us. I have an idea of what you see, because I see it in front of me, a group of faithful people who are passionate about not just speaking, but doing, who are proud of being part of a church that does not just speak, but does. So God, I ask that you bless us and that you keep us and that you empower us to continue in that work and that you give us hearts full of gratitude for the love that you have shown us, that you have shown us here. And that from that gratitude, we may return to you our service, our joy, our gifts, our talents, and our time. And Lord, may we honor the story of the widow. And may we hear the story of the widow. I trust you. I love you. And it's your name we pray. Amen. And thank you, Scott, for this faithful witness and proclamation of God's holy word today. I'm Pastor Rachel. If I haven't met you yet, I'm so glad that you're here. And at this time during our worship service, we come to the table together. And we all come to the table together. And what a gift and what a blessing it is to be a part of this chosen family. Um, this, is, this is the language we use here because... Um, because we come together and we see each other, many of us um, without other family members here maybe, but looking into each other, eye, other's eyes, um, recognizing that we indeed are family, that we are family um, as we are all children of God and all beloved by God. And um, just as Scott's witness um, showed you, there are many of you here who um, have been called to the ministry in different ways. And maybe, um, maybe you are a lawyer called to the ministry. Maybe you're a musician called to the ministry. Maybe um, you have shifted from ministry into something else in order to own and embrace your true identity. There's a lot of shit that the world does to us and knocks us off our course. Maybe helps us find a new one. But I'm glad it found you here, because being here means that we get to be family together. 
And being here means that we get to learn from each other and learn from the witness of each other's lives what God is doing in the midst of us and the ways that the Holy Spirit blows through this place. And then we all get to gather at this table together as one family, all gathered around one table. There are people in this room who have no home, who are not sheltered, yet bring gifts every single week. There are people in this room who are are, um, blessed with the gifts to um, preach and proclaim the gospel, and and yet I'm the one who gets to be paid to be your pastor or your leader, but I hope you know that I don't take that for granted. I am honored and humbled to be your pastor, but I am not the only one here to preach. The word that God has placed in your heart and in your life matters. And I am glad to be at the table with you. So let us partake of the sacrament together. creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. And he shared it with his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of a new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, 
do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. salvation poured out for you. You're invited to come and receive these gifts of God's love and forgiveness. You're invited first to receive, and then if you'd like to kneel at the altar and pray, you're welcome.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. God, your love never fails us. Help us to be renewed by the gift of your unconditional grace. May we continue to do your work in lifting up those that need it. Help us to be an advocate for others where systems fail, where the scales of injustice aren't in balance. May we strive to learn from each other and grow together in love that protects and uplifts. May courage and compassion call us into lasting solidarity with all of God's children to whom your love binds us forever. Amen. All right, I have been instructed to call up Lexi, which gives me a little bit of trepidation, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So Lexi wants the microphone. That was Lee. Lee was the first one to talk. Well, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being so willing to just listen to Kathy, Chuck, and I at all of the entrances telling you we're doing a secret operation. And I have been delighted this morning to look at the faces of Rachel and Ryan as they're like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> like, you're running like a chicken with your head cut off and everyone is running like crazy. So now I will let you in on what has been happening. It was, I was on time, but it was part of my mission to make half of our church late at the door. So it was partial, partially because I didn't want to be the only one that's always late. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lexi Reichman, and I'm the convener of the one board of our church. And I'm asking you to give again, but not to give money this time, but to give appreciation and your love. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we have definitely celebrated our pastors on days, um, sometimes on weekends. Um, but it is a month for a reason, and it's because of pastors like ours who give to us every single day of the month. So to kick off our Pastor Appreciation Month, um, our board wanted to present to our pastors these fabulous love boxes. Very, I mean, <laughs> would you expect anything different? So we do have one for Pastor Isabel as well, but for now I'll present them to Rachel and Ryan. Um, and while, I don't, is the choir going to come up? No? You're going to sit down? Um, okay. <laughs> is there a song, a song later? Okay. Well, we're just going to have some nice music while I ask the pastors to stand in the front. Um, and I'll put Pastor Isabel's box as well for you all to bring up your notes. And you will do, you'll do it like this. I brought mine for demonstration. So you could do that. And if you want... You can give a little hug, too. <laughs> you absolutely don't have to touch them if you don't want to, but they give really good hugs. Um, so if it's not today, I'm going to put Ryan's in, too. If it's not today, make sure sometime this month you bring a note in. For those of you joining us online, please bring in um, your words of appreciation or send them to us, and we will physically write them and put them in their boxes. But we want our pastors to know how much we love them and appreciate them all through the year, so they'll have plenty of notes to reflect on, even when we forget to say thank you for the incredible things they do. And Kathy has selected some awesome people in said audience to be a physical representation of our appreciation. So this is the cue for the piano, and for those people. <laughs> so y'all can come up and put your love notes in their boxes now.
a single. Thank you so much, y'all. We made them cry, we did the things. I think they feel appreciated and loved. The one thing I want to say for those of you who aren't here, who are bringing your notes later, they can't touch these notes until the end of the month. So they're just going to live here. So keep filling them. If they do something cool this week, throw in another appreciation. I'm alone in the sanctuary a lot. I'm totally going through them. You can't just leave them. Please rise as you're, thank you everyone. Know how much we appreciate it. Please rise as you're able and join us in our closing hymn, number 451, Be That My Vision.